This is chapter four of the history of heresies and the refutation by St. Alphonsus Liguori, the fourth century. In order properly to understand the history of the Donatists, we must separate the schism and from the heresy, for they were at first schismatics before they were heretics. Donatist I was the author of the schism. A second Donatist was the father of the heresy, and he was called by his followers Donatist the Great. In the beginning of the fourth century, Menzerius, Bishop of Carthage, was cited before the tyrant Maxentius on a charge of concealing in his house a deacon of the name of Felix, the author of a libel on the emperor. Menzerius went to Rome to defend himself and died on the way home. Cecilianus was elected by the general voice of the people to fill the vacancy, and was consecrated by Felix, Bishop of Aftongum, and other prelates. His opponents immediately began to question the validity of his consecration because it was performed by those bishops called traitors, Zalitoris, who delivered up the scriptures to the pagans. Another charge made against them was that he prohibited the faithful from supplying the confessors in the prisons with food. At the head of this conspiracy was a bishop of an African city called the Black Houses, whose name was Donatus, and it was very much strengthened by the intrigues of Lucia, a Spanish lady then residing in Carthage. Cecilianus happened to come into collision with her while he was yet a deacon because he reprimanded her for paying the veneration due to a holy martyr to a certain dead man, whose sanctity was never recognized by the church. To avenge herself on him for this, she became the soul of the conspiracy and by the influence of wealth brought over to a party many of the bishops of Africa, who uniting together in council under the presidency of the second primate of Numidia, deposed Cecilianus in his absence and elected a domestic of Lucia's in his place of the name of Majorneus, who was consecrated by Donatus. Notwithstanding all this persecution, Cecilianus remained steadfast in this faith which obliged the Donatists to have recourse to the Emperor Constantine. He referred the entire matter to St. Melchiades, the reigning pope, who in the year 315, or according to others, in 316, assembled a council of 19 bishops and declared both the innocence of Sicilianus and the validity of his consecration. The Donatists were discontented with this decision, and again appealed to the emperor. He used every means to pacify them, but seeing them determined to keep up the schism, he ordered Elianus, proconsul of Africa, to investigate the matter and find out whether the crime lay to the charge of Felix who consecrated Sicilianus that of delivering up the scriptures to the idolaters was true. The conspirators aware that this investigation was to take place bribed the notary of the name of Ingentius to prove a falsehood. But in his examination before the Pope Council, he acquitted both Felix and Sicilianus. The emperor, being informed of this, was satisfied as to their innocence, but in order to appease the Donatists and give them no cause of complaint, he caused another council to be convoked at Ares, to which St. Sylvester, who succeeded St. Melchiades in the year 314, sent his legate to preside in his name, and in that, and the following year, Felix and Sicilianus were again acquitted by the council. Nothing, however, could satisfy the Donatists. They, even according to Fleury, extended themselves as far as Rome. Heresy now is added to schism. The second Donatists, called by them Donatus the Great, put himself at their head, and although tinctured with the Arian heresy, as St. Augustine says, intruded himself into the sea of Carthage as successor to Majorinus. He was the first who began to disseminate the errors of the Donatists in Africa. Those consisted in the adoption of one false principle, which was the source of many others. This was that the church was composed of the just alone, and that all the wicked were excluded from it. Founding this belief on that text of St. Paul where he says that the church of Christ is free from all stain, Christ loved his church and delivered himself up for it, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. From St. Paul's letter to Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 27. They also profess to find this doctrine in the 27th verse of the 21st chapter of the Apocalypse. There shall not enter into it anything defiled. The adoption of this erroneous principle led them into many heretical consequences. First, believing that the church was composed of the good alone, they inferred that the Church of Rome was lost because the Pope and bishops, having admitted to their communion traitors, or those who delivered up the holy books into the hands of the pagans, as they alleged Felix and Sicilianus to have done, and as the sour leaven corrupted the entire mass, then the church, being corrupted and stained by the admission of those, was lost. It only remained pure in that part of Africa where the Donatists dwelt. And to such a pitch did their infatuation arrive that they quoted scripture for this also, interpreting that expression of the canticles, Shew me, O thou, whom my soul loveth where thou feedest, where thou liest in the midday, as relating to Africa, which lies in the southern part of the world. 
Another heretical influence of theirs was that the sacrament of baptism was null and void if administered out of the church, because the church that was lost had not the power of administering the sacrament, and on that account they baptized all proselytes. These two heretical opinions fall to the ground at once. By proving the falsity of the first proposition, that the church consists of the good alone, St. Augustine proves clearly that these texts of St. Paul and St. John refer to the triumphant and not to the Milton Church, for our Redeemer, speaking of the Milton Church, says, In many places it contains both good and bad. In one place he likens it to a threshing floor, with, which contains both straw and grain. He will thoroughly cleanse the floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. In another place, he compares it to a field sown with good seed and cockle growing amongst it. Let both grow, he says, till the time of the harvest, and then I will say to the reapers, Gather up first the cockle and bind it into bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. The Donatists were not content with the crime of heresy, but committed a thousand others, if possible of a deeper dye. They destroyed the altars of the Catholics, broke the chalices, spilled the holy chrism on the ground, and threw the holy Eucharist to the dogs. But St. Optatus Milavitanus informs us that God did not suffer the indignity to a sacred body and blood to go unpunished. For the dogs, getting mad, turned on their own masters and tore them, as if in revenge, for the insult offered to the body of Jesus Christ. Not satisfied with tormenting the living, they outraged the dead, whom they dragged out of the graves and exposed to the most unheard of indignities. About this time, also, the Circumcellionists sprung from the Donatists. Their chiefs were Faber and Maxidus, and they were called Circumcellionists from running about from town to town and house to house. They were called by Donatists, the chiefs of the saints. They boasted that they were the redressers of all wrong and injustice to the world, though nothing could be more unjust than their own proceedings. They gave liberty to slaves and commanded debtors not to pay their debts, telling them they were freed from all obligation. Their cruelty equaled their fanaticism. For they went about in armed bands and put to death those who did not become proselytes to their doctrine. But what was more astonishing than all was to see this fury turned against themselves, for many of them committed suicide by throwing themselves over precipices. Some cast themselves into the fire, others drowned themselves and cut their throats, and endeavored to induce others to follow the example, telling them that all who died so were martyrs. Even women followed the example of the husbands in this madness, and St. Augustine tells us that even some, in the state of pregnancy, threw themselves down precipices. It is true that even the Donatist bishops endeavored by every means to put a stop to such frightful fanaticism, and even called in the authority of the secular power to aid them, but they could not deny that they were their own disciples, and that they became the victims of such perverse doctrines from following their own example. The emperors Constantine and Constans sons of Constantine the Great and Valentinian, issued several edicts against the Donatists, but all was of little avail. In the reign of Honorius, an edict was published, giving liberty to all sects to profess publicly their doctrines. But about the year 410, the Donatists, taking advantage of this, broke out into several acts of violence, which so exasperated Honorius that, at the suggestion of the Catholic bishops of Africa, he revoked the edict. He then published that law, which punishes with confiscation of property the practice of any religion except the Catholic and even with pain of death, if the professors of any heretical doctrines should publicly assemble in their conventicles. In order, however, entirely to extinguish the heresy of Donatus, he sent the imperial tribune Marcellinus, a man of the greatest learning, and prudence to Africa, with orders to assemble all the African bishops, both Catholic and Donatist, in Carthage, to proceed to a conference to see who is right and who is wrong, that peace should be established between them. The Donatists at first refused to come, but the edicts of Honorius were too strict to be avoided, and they consented. And the conference was held in the Baths of Gazillion. 286 Catholics and 279 Donatists assembled, but Marcellinus, to avoid confusion, would only allow 36, 18 on each side, to hold the conference. These 18 be chosen from among all the rest. The systematics refused to obey the regulations of Marcellinus and used every stratagem to avoid coming to the point, especially they endeavored to cushion the question concerning the true church. But, with all their art, they were one day drawn into it, and seeing themselves caught, they could not help lamenting, saying, See how insensibly we have got into the bottom of the case. Then, it was that St. Augustine, as we have already shown, proved clearer than the noonday sun that the church is not composed of the good alone 
as the dancers would have it, but of the good and the bad, as the threshing floor contains both corn and chaff. Finally, after many disputations, Marcellinus gave this decision in favor of the Catholics. Many were united to the church, but many more persisted in their errors and appealed to Honorius, who would not even admit them to an audience, but condemned to a heavy fine all those who would not join the Catholic Church, and threatened to banish all the Donatist bishops and priests who would persist in their opposition to his decree. Nothing could exceed the malice against the Catholics after that. They murdered the defender of the Church, Restitutus, and plotted with the Count Marinus to the destruction of Marcellinus. The means by which Marinus accomplished this were horrible. He caused St. Marcellinus to be imprisoned on the charge of high treason, alleging that he was one of the chief promoters of the rebellion of Heraclean, which he was most innocent of, and although he swore to his friend Cecilianus that he would liberate both St. Marcellinus and his brother Aprinus from prison, he ordered him the next day to be taken out to a lonesome place and beheaded. Cardinal Orsi proves this on the authority of Arosius, St. Jerome, and St. Augustine. Thus, Marcellinus died a martyr, but Marinus was punished for his injustice, being shortly after recalled by Honorius and stripped of all his honors. In the Council of Carthage in 348, or as Hermat has it, in 349, the Catholic bishops of Africa assembled in great numbers to thank the Almighty for putting an end to the sect, and the schismatical bishops then joined them. In this council, it was prohibited to rebaptize those who were baptized in the faith of the Trinity, in opposition to the erroneous opinion of the Donatists, who declared that baptism, administered out of their communion, is invalid. It was also forbidden to honor as martyrs those who killed themselves, and they were allowed the rites of burial through compassion alone. Cardinal Boronius says that this sect lasted until the time of Gregory the Great, who endeavored to put an end to it altogether, and he also says that those heretics were the cause of the ruin of the Church of Africa.